In our first part, we looked at how the Sabbath is a, a sign of God's grace, that it's a sign, of, it's a reminder of God's grace of creation, that, that we exist simply because of God's grace. It's a reminder of the grace of salvation, that God is giving us eternal life simply through his grace. It's a, it's a reminder that, that God gives us his grace in our day-to-day lives. The Sabbath is a day of grace. And so we're continuing on this series, part two, Seventh Day Grace. How many of you remember having to take naps when you were growing up as a little kid? All right, several hands going up. That was one of my least favorite parts of being a kid. I hated taking naps. I just, I, I guess I knew my body was tired, but my mind, my mind always wanted to be up and about. And so I just did, detested taking naps. And so there's a phrase that is seared into my mind from, from that age, and it was, something that my parents would tell me, my grandparents would tell me, my kindergarten teacher would tell me, or whoever it was that was watching me after lunch when it was nap time. They said, Tyler, you don't have to sleep, but you have to lay down. Does that ring a bell with any, anybody in here? You don't have to sleep, but you have to lay down. And so I would lay there, and my mind would start to think of what else could I be doing while laying down. And so I, this eventually led to me making several requests of whoever was watching me. Can I at least uh, look at a picture book? I was you know, a little too young to read, I think. And, or, or how about coloring? Could I lay down and color? Or, or could I lay down and at least listen to music? Could I lay down and just do anything other than sleep? I don't want to sleep. And so I would get different responses, depending on who was making me take a nap. Sometimes my parents would let me do some coloring, uh, but my kindergarten teacher wouldn't. Uh, my grandparents would let me listen to music, but my parents wouldn't. And, and so it depended. Everyone seemed to have their own different list on what was acceptable and what was not acceptable for me to do during this period of rest. As I have studied the Bible with several people over the course of the years, people that want to know more about God, people that are wanting to get ready to be baptized. The question that I get, probably more than any other question, is what does it mean to keep the Sabbath holy? People understand the fourth commandment that that God says we're not supposed to work, but what else they want to know can we do? We, We understand that we have to lay down. But if we don't have to sleep, what else is there for us to do? It would be so much easier if there was a checklist. If somewhere in the Bible, God had given us a specific black and white list of things we are supposed to do and things we're not supposed to do in order to keep the Sabbath holy. But God doesn't work that way, and there is no checklist somewhere in Scripture. See, God wants us to use our minds, and he wants us to think critically about keeping the Sabbath, because what it really amounts to is entering into his presence. The Sabbath is this day to to connect with God, to build a relationship with him. And it's a pretty difficult, if not impossible, to to build a genuine relationship around a checklist. I mean, can you imagine going on a date and saying, all right, I complimented her on her appearance, check. I held the door open for her, check. I smiled with her, at her with warmth, check. That doesn't work, does it? It seems odd. It seems robotic. It doesn't lay a good foundation for a genuine relationship to blossom. And yet, so many of us approach the Sabbath with this checklist mindset. Today, the main truth that we're digging into is that our approach to the Sabbath reflects our understanding of grace. How we encounter the Sabbath, how we experience the Sabbath, our mindset when it comes to the Sabbath really is a prime reflector of how we experience our mindset when it comes to the total package of grace. 
See, we've been spending an entire year on this topic, on this theme of grace, because it is so important for us to really grasp the truth of grace because so many of us, almost all of us, our default position is a checklist mentality. Is, okay, have I done this or have I not done this to earn God's favor? Have I done this or have I not done this to to earn God's grace? Have I done this or not done this to earn salvation? And so this this checklist, this rule mentality really permeates most all of us, almost from the beginning. And that same mindset really applies to a lot of us or infects a lot of us when it comes to the Sabbath as well. I can almost guarantee you that, that if you have a checklist mindset when it comes to this seventh day of grace, you also struggle with a checklist mindset when it comes to the full experience of God's grace. But that's really the default setting that so many of us have had since really the beginning of our history with sin. That is why Skip McCarty writes um, in his book, In Granite or in Grain, there were many people in Israel who ceased from work on the Sabbath and attempted to abide by the more than 1,500 additional laws the rabbis had added to the Sabbath. Can you imagine that? A checklist that had 1,500 items on it. Yikes. That's a pretty intense checklist, right? Some examples from this 1,500 item checklist that, were, that was implemented in Jesus' day, the, the rabbis had come up with, one of, the, one of the rules was that you could not travel farther than 2,000 cubits, which is 1,000 yards on the Sabbath. If you happen to go 1,001 yards, that would be work, and that would be breaking the seventh day of rest. You would be breaking the Sabbath. Another rule was that you could not write more than one Hebrew alphabet letter. One of my seminary professors explained it because by, the, by saying this, if you've ever seen ancient Hebrew writing, the ancient Hebrew alphabet, he says it kind of looks a little bit like chicken scratch. Some lines and some squiggles. So, and it's, it's, it's possible, it's, it, it could happen that maybe you were sitting out in a chair in the, the sand or the, the dust or the dirt and you kind of scooted your chair and, and it might have made a squiggle of, of the Hebrew alphabet, of a letter. And that was okay because it was only one. But if you wrote a second letter, well, that was, you were doing it on purpose then, and that was work, and that was breaking the Sabbath. And of course, you could not at all erase any writing on the Sabbath, because erasing, that is definitely work as well. So this is why Jesus came to to help cut through this 1,500-item checklist to help remind people and and, and help restore the the truth of the Sabbath, the beauty of the Sabbath, the the grace of this seventh-day Sabbath. But as the saying goes, history repeats itself. And this checklist mentality reared its ugly head within the Christian church at various points throughout our history. And in particular, within Seventh-day Adventism, there's been some issues with having a checklist mindset when it comes to the Sabbath. If you were a member of the Seventh-day Adventist church 20 or 40 or, or 60 years ago, I'm sure you, you bumped up against a lengthy checklist of what you can and cannot do on the Sabbath day. One of the classic examples is if you were to go to the beach or go to the shore, you could put your feet in the water, maybe even go up to your knees. But anything past your knees, well, that was swimming and that was breaking the Sabbath. Or perhaps you had to abide by the rule of of making sure you had showered or or bathed before the Sabbath hours began. Because if you showered or or bathed during the Sabbath, then that was work and that was breaking the Sabbath. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I think people created these checklists with good intentions, at least at the beginning, because they, they knew the scriptures and, and they, they knew passages like Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 to 3 that says, By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. They, they knew that the seventh day Sabbath was a day of rest, and so they wanted to make sure it was a day of rest, and so they created these checklists to ensure that the Sabbath continued to be a day of rest. And yet there is a paradox here that in the very act of creating a checklist to ensure rest, you're in a sense stripping away your ability to enjoy this rest as God had intended. It's interesting that the word Sabbath is closely connected to the, the Hebrew word Shabbat, and it's closely connected to the Greek word Sabbaton. You can see they are all connected. They all have the, the same root, and, and they all literally mean rest. This is what Sabbath means. It means rest. And so I think it's interesting when you go and, and you plug in that, that the English transliteration of the Hebrew word Shabbat, if you plug in the word Sabbath back into this passage we just read, it reads like this. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he Sabbathed from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he Sabbathed from all the work of creating that he had done. I think this gives us a, a pretty amazing different perspective. It makes it, the Sabbath, it makes it sound appealing, doesn't it? It makes it sound peaceful. It, it makes it sound like a blessing. Notice God does not say, or the passage does not say, then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he created a lengthy checklist. He blessed it, made it holy because he Sabbathed. Our approach to the Sabbath reflects our understanding of grace. If we have a checklist approach to the Sabbath, and it is very easy for us to have a checklist approach to grace as well. The Sabbath has always been a gift for humanity. From the first Sabbath of creation week to the first Sabbath of November 2018, it has always been a gift. And when we start getting bogged down by, by making sure we've checked the right boxes or done this or not done that, it ceases to be a gift and it becomes a burden. And that is why Jesus says in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Jesus came to remind us that it has been a gift, it is a gift, it will always be a gift even though we have this tendency to try to make it something that it's not. The Sabbath is a gift, just like creation was a gift, just like salvation is a gift. It is all a gift of grace for you and for me. So now, some of you might be thinking, well, what does that mean then, Pastor? Does that mean I can just do whatever I want? I mean, if it's a gift, if it's just about grace, can I just go and, and do whatever I want to, whatever, whatever whim comes into my mind? Is that what the Sabbath is about? Unfortunately, there are some Christians that, that do have that mindset when it comes to the Sabbath. And they end up missing out on the truth and the beauty and the grace of that day, of this day. Just like those that have a checklist mentality miss out on the grace of the Sabbath. Because the Bible is clear. God says in the fourth commandment in Exodus chapter 20 verse 8, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. He says we're to keep it holy. So, so that means that, that there are clearly some things that we can do to not keep it holy. There are, there are things that we do or things that we don't do 
to make it special, to make it different, to make it unique from the other six days of the week. And that is why in the same kind of way of thinking, Paul writes about the larger concept, the larger issue, the larger experience of grace to the Christians in Rome. In Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 2, Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? He says, so you know about grace. Does that mean you can go and commit murder? Can you go and steal? Can you go and rob? Can you go and and be unfaithful to your spouse just because you have grace? By no means, he says. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? He says, because we have grace, because we understand grace, we know the, the, the difficulty and the pain that sin causes. And grace doesn't enable us to sin more. Grace enables us to live a better life. Grace enhances our life. Grace does not give us permission to go out and do whatever we want whenever we want to do it. Grace helps get rid of those bad impulses in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds. And that is why our approach to the Sabbath reflects our understanding of grace because just as understanding grace doesn't give us a free license to do whatever we feel, to do whatever we want, knowing the the fact, the truth, that the Sabbath is a gift doesn't give us really the permission to do whatever fancy or whim enters into our mind. So, after all of this, I can almost guarantee that some of you are thinking, so what can I do or not do to keep the Sabbath? (laughs) Give me some practical stuff here, Pastor. He said, okay, I understand we can't keep a a checklist, and and I know we can't do whatever we want, so so what are some things? You know, give give me some black and white concrete things. And it would be good if if I could. But the Bible doesn't give these concrete things other than to avoid work and business. It gives us principles, principles for us to apply to our own lives. But let me illustrate it like this. Let's say the Sabbath is like this beautiful single-layer chocolate cake. It's appealing, right? It's inviting. It looks tasty. You're like, oh, I I want to eat that. It is something that, that you look forward to trying, something you look forward to tasting. And, it, and it's something that we know is coming. Every seventh day, we get to enjoy the Sabbath. Every seventh day, this beautiful chocolate cake is going to appear in our lives for us to enjoy. Now, we don't only enjoy chocolate cake. There's other foods that we enjoy, right? Right? For example, one of the things that I enjoy is garlic. If you come to our house, we eat a lot of garlic. It's good stuff. It stays in our breath for years. But say this garlic, representing work, whether it's schoolwork or or work for your job, it's good, it's important, it's thing that you need to do, but, but even though you like garlic... What would happen if you add it to this beautiful chocolate cake? How is, how is that going to be? That looks good, doesn't it? It's looking better, right? And now say, now say um, you're like, okay, you know what else I like? I also like chili. You know? It's chilly, it's, it's getting fall, it's kind of, maybe not today, but it's, cool. it's going to get cool. And so what goes good? It's a nice weather for some, a nice bo- hot bowl of chili. And say this chili represents, I don't know, the chores that, have, that we have, our household chores. And we say, oh yeah, I, I could have done it at some other time, and, but you know, it, they've all built up, and, and let me just do some of these chores on the Sabbath. And we add some of this chili to this chocolate cake here. Mmm. It's looking good, huh? And then, let's say, you know, 
relish. Pickle relish. I mean, it goes good on hot dogs, on Big Franks. And say this relish, it represents some good things in our lives, some enjoyable things in our lives. Maybe video games, playing some Fortnite. Maybe uh, watching some sports. Maybe going shoe shopping. Things we enjoy, things that are fun. We think, oh, you know, the, the Sabbath, that's, that would be a good time for me to, to do these other enjoyable things. And so we add some pickle relish to this chocolate cake. Mmm. Now what has happened? This beautiful chocolate cake that, that was so appealing, so inviting, it has stopped looking delicious and started looking disgusting, right? <laughs> Does, is anyone eager to come up and try a piece of this garlic, chili, relish, chocolate pie, chocolate cake? No. This is disgusting. It's revolting. And so the Sabbath stops being something that is looked forward to, something that is anticipated, and it becomes something that people want to avoid. So let's say again, on the other hand, that Sabbath is like this beautiful single-layer chocolate cake. It looks good, it looks appealing, it looks inviting, it looks like something you want to try. But say you have some sprinkles representing, <laughs> representing a special meal that you get to enjoy with friends and family that you haven't been able to spend much time with. Oh, it looks a little, a little better. It looks a little more colorful. And say you also have some whipped cream. Representing uh, your, your friend, your neighbor, that doesn't have any family around, that's lonely, that, that really spends most of his day in his house alone and your time to go visit him. Or maybe this whipped cream represents someone sick that you know in the hospital, and you go spend time with her. Or maybe it represents getting together and, and feeding some people in the community that are in need of food. All of a sudden, your cake starts looking even better, even more appealing. And say you also have some strawberries representing maybe your um, going out into God's nature, going on a nice hike, going out relaxing at the park, spending time in God's creation that you don't get to do on the other six days of the week. Now what's happened to this chocolate cake? It looked good before, but now it's even better. It looked tasty before, but now it's going to taste even better. Now this chocolate cake that you looked forward to eating before, now you really want to have a piece of it because the things you've added to it have enhanced the experience of the Sabbath. And this is what we are called to do. This is what it means to keep the Sabbath holy. But we're different people. We have different interests. And so you might be allergic to strawberries, and you think, you know what, going out in, on a nature hike on the Sabbath, that would ruin the Sabbath for me. I don't want to go outdoors. I would much rather stay at home writing cards or, or letters of encouragement to, to some people I know that, that need a word of, of help and encouragement. And so instead of having strawberries, maybe you sprinkle on some coconut. Your cake is going to look a little different from my cake. My cake's going to look a little different from my parents' cake. Because God is inviting us into a relationship with him on the Sabbath, and he wants to have a relationship with you, and that relationship's going to look different than his relationship with me. And, and that's how the Sabbath is. And yet we are still all united 
because we are all keeping the Sabbath holy, because you are doing what you need or want to do to enhance the Sabbath. I am doing what I need or want to do to enhance the Sabbath. And yet we together are keeping the seventh-day Sabbath holy and building that relationship with God. I want to close this morning by sharing a testimony here from Shelley Quinn, who's a Christian author and speaker who became a, a seventh-day a Sabbath observer later in her life. She says, I grew up in a family that demanded perfection from me. The church I attended as a youth painted a picture of a wrathful God who also demanded perfection. I thought the Heavenly Father was watching over me, ready to zap me when I missed the mark. All of my life I was performing for acceptance, for my family's and my God's acceptance. And it wasn't long until the Lord taught me his Sabbath truth that I was cut free from this cord of this performance mentality. The first time I ever experienced complete freedom from performance was on the first Sabbath I celebrated. I sensed I had been given permission to sit back, relax, and enjoy. No work, no daily duties, no demands. But most of all, I had the whole day to spend with God. I suddenly knew that I knew he would sanctify me, causing me to be all that he called me to be. Talk about entering his rest. There is nothing like it. It's a sign for me to remember that it is God who works in me to sanctify me, who works in me to develop Christ's character of holiness. Still, towards the end of the week, I sometimes find I'm slipping back into my performance mentality, thinking I'm not doing enough for God. But as I welcome the Sabbath, God reminds me of Galatians 3.3. 3. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? The Sabbath reminds me that apart from Christ, I can do nothing. My life experience with God went through a radical transformation when I began celebrating his seventh-day Sabbath. I became aware that his grace is sufficient. His power is made perfect in my weakness. I learned obedience is the pathway to blessing, and it's so much easier to obey now that I know to depend totally upon him for all things. Celebrating the Sabbath has taught me to receive God's love in a new dimension. And that is what the Sabbath is about. That is why God has gifted it to us. And that is why God has called us to remember it. Because it's a blessing for you. It's a blessing for me. And it helps us to understand His grace. Our approach to the Sabbath reflects our understanding of grace. So this morning, the question for us is, what kind of cake do you want to eat? Do you want to experience a, a day that's kind of like any other day? In fact, it might be a, a little worse than other days because it's just a, a mess. It's a mess of you trying hard. It's a mess of, of you trying to keep a checklist. It's a mess of you mixing in the work and the, the hobbies that, that you fill the rest of your days with? Or do you want to eat a cake that's appealing? A cake that has a little uh, color to it with the sprinkles. A cake that's fun. A, a cake that has some flavor. A cake that is tasty and delicious. A cake that is a, appealing. Which cake do you want to eat? What kind of Sabbath do you want to experience? Because every seven days we get to experience the Sabbath, whether we're ready for it or not, whether we want to or not. And it's up to us. What kind of Sabbath are we going to have? Are we going to have a Sabbath that really should be avoided at all costs? Are we going to truly experience a Sabbath of grace and of rest? and of connection with our Savior. How many of you want to enjoy a Sabbath day of rest? A Sabbath day of beauty and grace? Praise God, I do too.